Uh, great topic. Um, and we're going to continue on with this sort of a, a, a discussion uh, in just a minute here. Um, you know, investors, markets, uh, and commercialization, and when is the right time to go commercial? Um, while we are transfer transitioning over, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank a bunch of people. First off, our University of Maryland students who are here helping out with uh, all of the stuff that you see going on. Thank you to all of them. Uh, thank you to our AV team. They're up there. You don't see them a lot, but Bill, Dave, uh, Garrett, Jenny, thank you very much for everything you're doing. Thank you to the AAS staff, uh, uh, Liana and Marta, who are uh, working away here. Uh, thanks to Ron Burke, AAS president, um, who supported this uh, all along. And thank you very much to people that are up working registration um, and have worked registration at this event for longer than I've been here. Uh, uh, Linda and Bob, uh, thank you to both of you for everything you've done. Bob's been doing this for volunteering here at the Goddard Symposium for more than 20 years. Uh, so we appreciate him being here and doing that. So it looks like our panel is getting seated here and getting set up. Let me uh, just grab. I don't think you guys don't have any slides, right? Nope. Uh, and so we'll get started with our final session of the day. Uh, this one is called, When is Commercialization the Right Choice? Thank you once again to Northrop Grumman for your uh, very generous sponsorship for the entire day. Uh, we truly appreciate it. So join me uh, in welcoming our moderator, Michael Mealing. Michael is general partner and CEO at Starbridge Venture Capital, a space sector finance firm currently developing a series of venture capital funds. Michael is also a board member of the Space Frontier Foundation uh, and the Alliance for Space Development. Uh, some might know Michael from his uh, an earlier role as CFO of Maston Space Systems, and then uh, he went into venture capital as CTO with Atlanta-based Seraph Group. Michael regularly advises firms and governments concerning market and policy conditions necessary for the expansion of human civilization in their solar system and beyond. So a totally appropriate moderator for this session. Michael, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks everybody for, for being here today. This should be a, an interesting conversation. Um, I do intend on holding the last uh, third of, the, of this to have a discussion with the audience. So um, write down your questions and save them for toward the end. We'll reserve time. Um, so uh, today we have uh, Camille Aline, Deputy Program Manager, Commercial Leo Development Program at NASA JSC. Um, Tim Crane, Vice President of Research and Development at Intuitive Machines. Um, Andre Mitran, di Director of Strategy and Business Development and civil, of Civil and Commercial Business Unit within Northrop Grumman. And replacing David Dutcher, we actually have Bill Beckman, Director of NASA Programs at, uh, in DC for Boeing. And so what I'd like to do is uh, start off with a quick question and let everybody give an individual introduction to themselves. And that first question, I'd like everybody to kind of weigh in on, to give the crowd an idea of the definitional problems we have with what the term commercialization means. Um, could each of you please give uh, what, at least from your firm or your point of view on what the term actually means so that we can set the stage for the rest of the conversation. So starting with Camille. Yes, thank you, Michael. I think my job is done because the last panel talked <laughs> so much about what we're doing in Commercial Leo. Um, so uh, I'm Camille, Camille Lane, the Deputy Program Manager for Commercial Leo Development Program at NASA Johnson Space Center. Our program was set up in July of 2020 and we're responsible for coalescing all the Leo commercialization activities for NASA in terms of human space flight. Um, what that looks like is our investment and you heard from the other panel who our partners who are building their commercial space station is us as a program enable and an agency enabling the development of those commercially owned and operated LEO destinations beyond ISS end of life. But we are also stimulating demand, right, for um, those areas that are high potential markets to help reduce the risk for the CLDs or the commercial LEO destinations. So what does commercialization look like to us? It looks like NASA being one of many customers, truly, 
right um with these destinations uh which means opening it up to beyond the u.s government to sovereign nations to who want to maybe get into to leo that they won't possible it wasn't possible for them with the international space station um being able to mature markets such as in space manufacturing and production or uh, commercial advertising and marketing for us it looks like uh having commercially owned and operated transportation systems for crew and cargo we have that now with spacex and boeing for commercial crew and then orbital not Rob grumman Sorry, Andre, <laughs> and um, and SpaceX for commercial cargo. So the expansion of that. It looks like commercially owned and operated destinations that are safe, that are reliable, that are cost effective. If they are not cost effective, they're not sustainable. And if they're not sustainable, we as an agency and a nation cannot meet our goals. We want to be able to continue to do research in Leo to meet our exploration goals, but also as a national lab. And really, um, it's the regular production, distribution, and trade of goods and services like we do here on Earth. And finally, for us, is the sustained US presence and preeminence of the US in low Earth orbit. And you heard Brent talking about that in the other panel. So really, we do not want to have a gap in LEO. And so commercialization enables us as a nation to maintain that preeminence in, in, in space. Yeah, Tim Crane, um, I'm actually the chief technology officer now at Intuitive Machines, which didn't change my job responsibilities in any way at all. Um, and I thought I wasn't going to be nervous sitting next to Camille because she used to be one of the program managers at the Commercial Lunar Payload Services and my main customer. Um, but after that eloquent speech, I'm nervous again. Oh, and so uh, well, yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, definitely commercialization is not a is it commercial or is it not generally. Um, and I think there's really two axes that you have to consider. One is, is absolutely what's the percentage of your revenue or your, your, your project income that comes from the government. And uh, concepts like the government being one of the many customers, you know, definitely moves you along that axis where you can be considered more commercial, completely commercial. But the other one too, I think, is the, is the freedom of business model and, and the market shaping. So. Um, at the extreme, a cost plus government contract with specifications from one customer is absolutely not commercial, right? And that's what we've all gotten used to. And we've moved out of that where, uh, for example, with commercial lunar payload services, not, NASA said not only do we not want to be the only customer, but we want to give uh, the companies that are providing services to us the freedom to go explore what the other business models look like. And so how do we shape the business arrangements? How do we approach investors? Um, how do we build infrastructure? The ability to move in that space in a way, I think is as important as where does the money come from? Because if it's just the same contract mechanism coming from different people, eventually you know, from government and not government, that's gonna not, not do well. But the ability to go out and begin to find out what are the business to business uh, services and goods that we can provide and are we providing uh, long-term contracts? Are we providing long-term services? Are we doing this in a speculative way? I think there's a rich space there that, that gets a little bit away from the, the strict revenue interpretation of commercialization and how are we able to structure uh, the deals and the, uh, the revenue streams and generate new markets? All right, so Andre Mitran, uh, North Government Civil and Commercial. So to answer that question, let me ask you a question. Who wants to go to space? Okay, so you have two choices, right? You have a government choice. You have apply for an astronaut candidate program. Hopefully you qualify. All, all expenses paid for, right? And you go into space. That's, uh, that's one way. Another way is uh, buy a ticket, and that's commercial, right? From a Northrop Grumman or uh, manufacturer perspective, obviously we have a, a unit called civil and commercial. Civil means essentially civil agencies, US government, international governments. Commercial to me, it means, and for us particularly, it means open market, meaning if you are a telecommunications company and you want to purchase a satellite or a constellation, we can do that for you. If you want your satellite to be extended, 
right? Maybe some type of light manufacturing. We have mission extension vehicles, mission robotic vehicles on orbit right now, performing that for companies like Intelsat. That's purely commercial. That's not exclusive to commercial private companies, meaning governments can also take advantage of that. And it's not commercial of the shelf in that, obviously our satellites are not sitting in a warehouse. We're still designing, there's still some customization. But fundamentally, we are governed by the Department of Commerce rules as opposed to a very exquisite payload for a very specialized US government entity. And that's fundamentally and in reality how we see commercialization while there are a lot of economic definitions to it. Hello, I'm Bill Beckman with Boeing. Uh, I see out here there's some fans of Dave Dutcher, so uh, my apologies that you showed up and Dave was unable to be here, but I'll do my best to fill in for him. So the, the question on the table here is, uh, our view of commercial and, and i'd say from our perspective it's it's a word that's in transition right now uh i'll argue that we've always been commercial uh we've been providing systems to in space to the u.s government is our main customer um that has taken them through their formative years where there were no capabilities, where it was cost plus contracts in order to, to put these systems in place and do a lot of learning. We're kind of at a, a, at a bend in the road, if you will, right now, to where these systems have, I think you heard it on the previous panel, there's a sense, we, we know where the bumps in the road are, we know where the challenges are. Um, from a business perspective, we can see where there's opportunities just based on our experience. So I think we're on a, a bold journey with you know, our government customer as you know, budget came out today, budgets are tighter and tighter. The good thing is, is that there's a lot of enthusiasm. There's a lot of interest in space and new investment coming in to where it's more of a shared uh, destiny right now to where as we move past uh, out of the unknown unknowns more into the, the knowns uh, that we can make informed decisions and and take a, a look at what else could we use these systems for outside of our primary customer use. And with that, it opens up the art of the possible. Um, it, it gets us looking at business cases differently than we have in the past. And so I'm gonna say, we're gonna be in this transition period for a while. Um, again, we've been commercial from the start. There will be more commercial as we move forward into these systems. And I think it's, you know, a lot of it is going to be dependent upon the market dynamics. Um, it, it's exciting. And I see a lot of opportunity in people who are entering the market in a pure commercial fashion. And how do we leverage that? How do we, we bring it? Um, and I'll say that, you know, we will continue to, you know, to serve the, the greater needs. And I'll say that we've gone through uh, maybe three phases. One is creating that concept, understanding it. Uh, now we're into looking how to use these in new and different ways. And with that opens the opportunity space for us uh, to encourage more investment and to, uh, to create more uh, business cases and understanding the risk to where I think we can convince those uh, in investment people and our own companies to say that this is a solid investment and we feel that we've got our arms around it and we can predict with a sense of certainty that there is a return on the investment. Cool. Thank you. Um, and as moderator, but an investor, I'm going to at least take off my moderator hat from time to time and participate in the conversation. So we'll see where that goes. Um, one of the things that is th that we see on the commercial side, looking at you know plans, whether it's CLD or, or the lunar, especially anything beyond geosync, lunar service operations. We talk about these notional markets that don't quite exist yet. Um, you know, water ice on the moon. We don't know exactly how to get it out of there yet. Um, originally, the entire idea from um, ULA was predicated on using that water to bring down to LEO to provide you a way to, to transport commsats and other satellites to geosync cheaply. We don't have a, a thriving geosync market the way we did at the time that came out. So we have a lot of markets that are notional. We don't have the data. There's a lot of 
um, moving pieces that depends on market players showing up that so far they're not showing up. Um, so when it comes to those kind of notional businesses and markets out there, what are the key roles that we think, because we're all you know, generally government contractors right now in one form or another, um, and we love you to death, um, is what other uh, ways can the government act in promoting commercialization of space, especially in those notional markets? Those things where investors that have, in our case, I have to give a return within 10 years, look at it and going, that's outside my investment horizon. Um, and I think this even came up last time, you know, patient capital, the role of that. You know, think about ways that if you were President Biden, what would you stand up and say, we need to do this to incentivize these markets to, to, to exist? Any thoughts? It's, I'll take the first one here. I'd say where we're at today, if you look at things in a very generic fashion, um, the, the science is kind of taking us. It's leading the way for us, if you will. Um, in the science realm, you spot something with a telescope, you send a, a flyby mission to understand it in, in greater detail and saying what's there. If you see something of interest, you send an orbiter to understand it even further. It's followed on by a, a lunar rover, and now you start getting ground truth. What is really there? Um, and that's where you know the smart businessman can say, um, is there something I can do with, with what is there? Um, but that's not enough right there. You need to go to the next step. And I think that's kind of where we're at with, with lunar exploration and maybe to some extent with low Earth orbit, but actually prospecting, sending the astronauts there. What is, what is really the true uh, ground truth of there? Um, what does it look like? You, you mentioned water, ice, and you know how easy it is to extract. You, I think you can get a lot of knowledge out of sending robotic uh, probes there, but having a human adds that extra flexibility and that real-time engagement. And so I think you know the, the government's role is to to peel back that next layer of the onion and provide the information that would allow other users, commercial users, to come in and, and say, what can we do with that? And I think, you know, we're seeing it right now with small landers to help us in there. And so I think there is uh, space within the mission sets right now for innovation to come through and help us with prospecting and, and understanding that. But I think, you know, uh, hopefully it's not a bad word, the exploitation, once you find something, how do you, how do you capitalize on that? What can you do with it? Uh, you know, to get a return on your investment. We, we prefer the term right-sized landers, not small landers. Um, <laughs> just to get that out there. Um, I seem to be talking in twos today, so I'll, I'll stick with that. When you go talk to an investor, uh, if I were to come to you, I, well, you would ask me, hey, what's your market and what's your capability to deliver to that market? You know, what are the barriers to entry? Those are standard business questions that you ask regardless of sector, right? And when we saw in the previous panel that a lot of the barriers to entry, the technology, the lessons learned for Leo have been retired by the government. Um, I think we need a continued press uh, to do the things, Bill, you talked about, to develop capability for the moon. So investment in, in capabilities and demonstrations so that the barrier of entry for us to do things beyond Leo uh, continues to drop so that the risk is reduced. But being a steady customer is also very, very important. So um, instead of saying maybe here is a mission to go and do something to collect data and we're gonna fund that mission, could we begin thinking about, here's how much we'll pay for that data if you were to deliver it. So now I could go to a VC and say, well, NASA has said they'll pay this much per kilobyte of two centimeter um, you know, resolution ground truth near an Artemis landing site. Well, that's a business case. And, and now I just have to say, look, that this is the, the total available market for those of you who you know, have done a little bit of business and MBA courses. And then here is our probability of capturing that and the cost to do it. Now we've, we've entered the realm of regular commercial business. So I think continuing to press in the capabilities and the technology as NASA has always done it, and the government beyond NASA is, is important. But for the customer to also say, we will be a regular customer 
for some of the early things we can do. And then as that capability catches up and we begin to deliver these things, other people will have entrepreneurial thoughts of, wow, if there's a capability to get a two centimeter ground sample uh, distance map on the moon, I could do this. And then we'll see the commercial side outside of the government begin to catch up. And, you know, you're thinking in terms of the exploration, infrastructure, exploitation, right? That there's a role in government in initially initiating the charge and then delivering to the commercial market. When we're looking at it from a little bit of precedent from commercial resupply services, commercial crew, CDFF, right? In the evolution of CDFF or commercial destination free flyer. And we at Northrop have been privileged in being part in two of them, certainly Boeing and commercial crew. Interestingly, I see government first as first investor, very important, right? Kind of an anchor investor for manufacturers and, and folks that want to start developing the preliminary uh, elements of that infrastructure beyond exploration. The second level, I see them as a price taking customer. And that's important, meaning we're very used to operating on the civil and military space as a singularly focused uh, delivery of services or goods to, to the government. But if the government steps back and become a price taker, I mean, I will be one of many, then it gives the industry tremendous ability to customize for more, right? And then it gives me that ability to achieve, what am I looking for in commercialization? I'm looking for cost savings through economies of scale, economies of scope, some type of network effects. That's very important, multi-facing markets, right? Not too many other ways in which you can deliver increase delivery per price point. But in order to do that, I need to attract others, therefore some flexibility. So government as a price taker is important. And the third element is advocacy in two forms. And number one advocacy is for me to bring additional customers or for us to bring additional customers into the market. If we go to biomedical, to Johnson & Johnson and say, come and let's, uh, let us build scalability of uh, you know, bioengineering they're probably equally or more uh, worried than we are about a commercial space market and their investment in it. But with advocacy from government, from NASA saying we're here as an anchor tenant, it increases the chance of that third party to joining, right? And becoming part of this equation. Uh, vertical integration plays a role in that as well. Uh, and the second part of advocacy is some type of regulatory certainty. So regulation can be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, there's some good regulation out there that creates certainty, uh, addresses issues of indemnity and other very key elements here. And government as a stabilizing force in defining the rules of the market will be absolutely critical in our ability to join and partake in that market. And I think you are one of the first people that have actually discussed the role of advocacy by the government. Because all of the previous conversations that we always have, it's either, contracting methods or um, fixed price contracts and things like that, but um, never underestimate the ability for the government standing up and saying, we think this is a good idea. Um, perfect example of that is the, the recent moves by the UK, um, Japan, and Europe on space-based solar power. All of that based on simply one office in NASA saying we're writing a paper and we think it's a good idea advocacy can have a great role in, in incentivizing a lot of things. Um, I'm going to move on to one more question I'm going to get out and then in about 10 minutes we're going to flip over and, and start uh, asking the room and I understand there may be some entrepreneurs in the room so happy to talk to you guys afterwards too. Um, so, the man. Yeah. <laughs> um, but these may be your customers so talk to everybody. Um, American, well actually this is an interesting, I'll go back to the first one. Um, companies such as SpaceX, uh, Underhill, um, and, and Palantir in a completely different sector um, have a thesis whereby they actually, through the ambitious leadership and friendly capital, a lot of times capital from their own networks, um, have a business model of willing a market into existence um, by pushing profitability off into the future investors get a return by selling out through that. Um, and so there's are proof cases in the market where what normally would not look like a, an intelligent business decision to go into market, if you're the one that goes in there and beats that market into submission through the force of will and capital, 
you can make it exist. Um, for the organizations here and even NASA, if you want to, um, is there a role for that in this business? And how how would your companies, you know, specifically some of the Northrop Grumman and, and Boeing, how do you play in a market where there are companies that can come in and raise, you know, many billions of dollars in the private markets and do things that are not that that typical decisions of going into a particular product line or market don't make sense. How do you respond to that? And what lessons might you have learned from that? Sure, I'll, <laughs> I'll take the first one. So overall, and on a caveat note, you know, there's sometimes a lot of negative talk about billionaires joining the, the space programs. And I, I think that's maybe missing uh, a greater reality that is, I'm sure those those folks and, and their companies have an esoteric interest in the benefit of mankind. So undeniably, you know, the entrance of SpaceX has revolutionized launch, which is helping us all, us all, right? So certainly we feel competitive pressures from it, but if you take it case by case, you know, we may feel competitive pressure in one arena, but then we have an opportunity to differentiate in another. Mm -hmm. So even the SpaceX example, certainly we appreciate their launch services when we need them. So that's one more option for us, make versus buy versus partner. But then it also teaches me to adapt and to offer capabilities when we compete, for example, in the commercial resupply services, our services are actually different. They're differentiated. And with certain things that we do, they are better than they, and there are certain things they do better than us. But in order to, to avoid commoditization, we actually differentiate. So it forces us to adapt it doesn't feel good, but it's good overall, right? So it's, it's something we welcome the competition and we take it from there. The other interesting part, and you mentioned vertical integration in willing a market into being, which it's in some cases in history shows us it may be necessary. And the good news is that in general it tends to be temporary because in time specialization dictates that all those companies realign and folks in the value chain tend to develop certain specializations and deliver increased value and together do better. And I was gonna give this, this is a shout out to strategic partnerships. So how do you combat uh, vertical integration? In my opinion, strategic partnerships, I'm gonna name a few. So commercial destination free fly are a wonderful opportunity for us to collaborate. Uh, there were certain capabilities that we didn't have and we reached out to a wonderful partner named Dynetics and is sitting there and we're partnering with them on CDFF uh, and then they, in turn, came back and invited us to be on their human landing team for additional complementarity. So between the two of us, almost like a football team, we're learning to cooperate. And we're not vertically integrating, but we are trying to be experts and good team players in that arena. And I'm sitting next to Tim. It's the same relationship is developing. We, when we're looking at uh, lunar landers for some of our inequities, the good news is because of clips, there are plenty of of folks to analyze. So for us, make versus buy was relatively easy. Let's look at who we'd like to partner with. All of a sudden now we discovered a very interesting and, and great partner. And again, we're moving from one, one opportunity to another with them. So we're learning from each other and you, you create, I would say, exponential partnerships because of that. And then to our traditional partners and competitors at Boeing, for example, when we see something like commercial crew, we certainly, we, we root for their success as we root for SpaceX success. And now I don't have a monopoly stopping me crew. I have two, which is better than one. Hopefully there'll be more in the future. So strategic partnerships are a powerful way for us to move forward. And I'm not saying, I don't want to say fight vertical integration, but to a certain extent, ameliorate it okay. while staying focused. Let me, let me jump in on that a little bit because um, I think a varied uh, economic ecosystem in a sector is a very healthy sign. And so, I wouldn't ask a Boeing or Northrop Grumman to take the same kind of risks and development that a company like ours did when we got started. It's not appropriate. But we can find partnerships where we'll say, hey, uh, you know, this is a big institutional effort on this opportunity. We have some ideas that we can offer um, to some of the traditional aerospace companies. And through that strategic partnership and blending of, of a richer ecosystem of, of companies, younger companies, smaller companies, um, some companies which take more risk and in these different models. I think we're going to see a, uh, an explosion of different ideas without having to come in and say, hey, if you're an existing aerospace company, 
you've got to reinvent your entire culture um, from the bottom up. Because there are things that the big aerospace companies do very, very, very well, and we don't want to lose that. Um, but a blend of maybe some of the new ways of thinking is an opportunity to uh, take some of these disruptive forces from below, Michael, mm -hmm. and, and make them you know, part of where we're headed. And we love the diversity. We love the diversity of offerings. Sometimes we go into, you know, we have a, an, an objective, but we don't know everything we'll need, right? And then companies come along and they, they br bring innovation. That's why we love commercialization. They bring these innovative solutions to the table. We love competition because it helps drive down costs for us, right? Um, so then, so we don't know everything we need. And so when companies come up with these innovative ideas, it's really, it's great for us. And we can, we can leverage those offerings. But I guess one of the questions I have for NASA in this particular case, um, given what SpaceX plans to do with, with Starship mm -hmm. and, and how vertically integrated they are, but also how much they've dominated the launch market right now um, and the sustaining lunar development program and the need to have that competition, yeah. um, we are going to still have coming, the number of, of former SpaceX and Tesla engineers and entrepreneurs out there now building new companies that take that same vertically integrated model. Um, is there a concern within NASA on competition and preserving a diversified market for your, the things that you need? Absolutely. Because one of the barriers to entry for opening up space and really democratizing space is the access, the cost of access to space. So we need, we need competition, right? And the way you get that is through, you know, re reusability, um, but we really need that for us to be able to do what we want to do, but also for these other companies that are developing these platforms to be sustainable. They need to have, we need to have that breadth of offerings in terms of launch, launch transportation. But I think there's, there is some value in, in, in companies that do vertically integrate or see vertically integrate and or go after a market that everyone thinks was, is, you know, bat blank crazy that you would do that. Um, you know, reusable launch vehicles that land vertically at the Cape and you want to do what? Um, and, and by the way, NASA tried that early on. Oh, yes. In, <laughs> in fact, the shuttle days. In, in fact, that was <laughs> my group at JSC exactly. studied that, yeah. the, the liquid yeah. flyback booster yeah. twice, and yeah. it was on the wall of shame yeah. of things we yeah. didn't, we, yeah. we, you know, you walk by oh, and go, yeah, we weren't up. able to get it to work, and yes. then, then they did and it. Then, they yeah. I really need to see the wall of shame there. Um, <laughs> So that there is a value in sometimes, in, like for example, pushing through those, those, for example, at least for most VCs, we look at the lunar market and we cannot, we see a lot of infrastructure, but we cannot identify who the user of that infrastructure is. So let me, let me, let me take a stab at that sure. because yeah. um, to a certain extent, your question about, uh, you know, the SpaceX and Andrew, there's almost a bill that may will come aspect of that right uh we were so excited when we got our first clips contract that nasa had not taken our full manifest capability we we're like, great and they only want to be one of many customers let's go out and sell payloads to the moon and in year one what we found out is we would talk to people they go i don't understand what you're saying mm -hmm. <laughs> the concept of a ride share or of a fractionated mission to the moon was not something that had been in people's thoughts if you're going to do a mission to a moon you competed very uh, at a very high level as a PI, and NASA gave you funding, and you dictated the mission. It was very expensive, top to bottom. There you go. That was the way you, you did something at the moon. So no one had thought of, you know, what if I could get someone to take 10 kilograms to the moon, provide all the transportation and the launch integration, power and data back? I could do some really good science. Not in the thought space at all in year one. In year two, as we start going around symposiums and talking to people, research institutions, departments within NASA and, and the military said, okay, yeah, we've been thinking about it. Now that we know that that is a thing, we've thought, well, my, what might we do? And then last year, we, we started coming around and, and walked away from one conference with six metric tons of payload opportunity. Mm -hmm. So it took the thought that a thing could be for the customer base to realistically begin planning, you know, they have budget cycles, they have approvals, they have to go through. And so we're starting to see some of that, but it was never going to happen organically in, in the leadership of the government to say, how do we spur that market on? We actually are seeing it quite a bit. 
Would you say that the, the length of that sales cycle, three years to get to a contract, was because of the internal funding cycle? Or do you have any, any thoughts about ways yeah. we can break out of that? Well, the first one we went really, I mean, I was at the forefront to help stand that program up, but we went really quickly. I'm really talking about the, but the commercial, when we went out and started talking to other people okay. about, would you not NASA <laughs> like to be on board? Sure. It started with, I don't understand, and then um, now we, we get, um, you know, people that aren't even in government agencies saying, hey, look, I've got five kilograms and I want to I do something on the moon. And so, um, but they do it because they know it can exist. And I, I do think for some, it was a budget cycle. Uh, you, know, you, you had to have the idea and then you gotta, you've got to put a plan together and you have to have your own approvals. And even at a five kilogram level for the surface of the moon, it's still expensive, you know, and that's not usually discretionary funding or something that, other than billionaires. So you think there's a, a portion of this that is lowering the barrier to entry, that you can get more people who otherwise didn't see a way to on-ramp into lunar exploration in order to afford and express their interest in a financial way? That if NASA is a key customer on a, on a lunar transportation or communication mission, and then there are um, residual opportunities that you can then offer with some of your cost risk reduced. You can go out and pursue those customers and say, hey, would you like to buy 5% of my bandwidth? Or would you like to help me put a survey instrument uh, on an orbiter and collect prospecting data because I'm already going for this other mission? Those opportunities now exist. So as you look at your, as your lunar development, you know, I'm not picking on lander size, but you, you're, you're starting off on the, the smaller end of the spectrum, and I know you've got plans for larger. Do you see that as kind of creating its own set of infrastructure and building there and really complementing and maybe, you know, augmenting some of the, the planned NASA architecture? Yeah, I really do um, in, in a couple of ways. One, we built the, our first lander uh, with a 100 kilogram landed target because we thought that's what the market could fill. You know, no reason to build a four metric ton lander if I don't have four metric tons of payload. Um, and then the ability to demonstrate capability in smaller buys will allow NASA, I think, to have some success well below the billion dollar or multi hundred million dollar level. And now we get back to what Camille was talking about, the democratization of space, more people involved, more ideas, more perspectives. You want to get those in because the permutations of different people and different concepts and different ideas will reveal opportunities and capabilities we have not yet imagined. But I think one of the things for, for anybody in the room that's thinking about doing a startup, your sales cycle to getting from anything novel and educating the market and finding those pockets of customers that are, have something, are willing to create, to think creatively, and may be able to identify the budgets to be able to support it, sales cycles in this business are still far longer than they probably should be. So I, that was, yeah. I'd say right. it's a cross between you know, everybody getting awareness and then just the inherently long product cycle of, of aerospace. It just takes a while to, to get these things off the drawing board and, and onto a rocket. So I'd say, you know, we're making very good strides in the right direction right now. I think you know, we just, you know, patience. And, you know, I think as we get some success uh, with, you know, some of these systems, I think that'll just continue to bootstrap more and more interest from you know other potential users in the investment community hopefully you know I'm, I'm looking to you to say is that the signal you're looking for the signals that we're looking for are those in end customers so one of the ways that we actually think about these things is um we look to find who the ultimate customer is so whenever i'm talking to an, uh, uh, somebody's looking at selling into the agriculture earth observation market I'm like, I asked them the question, you know, who's your ultimate customer? And they'll say the farmer. I'm like, no, it's the human being that wants a tasty meal that's reliable, safe, and cost effective. If nobody eats the food, the farmer is finding something else to do. And when we look at a lot of the business models, things that are people talking about on the infrastructure side, I cannot find that ultimate customer. Mm -hmm. And that right now, everybody's relying on NASA to be that ultimate customer yeah. and some of the other oh, you the know, large you know, yeah. international, you know, national agencies. But it's that you know, push through to find out. It's one of those things where we sort of know what the end state looks like. You know, it, it's Star Trek or whatever, and you know, along the way we can figure it's the it's the path to get there. 
and some people plow through it by just throwing gobs of money at it and then other ways it's coalitions and putting it together and working at it so that's one of the things as an investor finding somebody that has a has a way of making money along the way that generates investor returns along the way but you're building a capability when that when that that market does identify itself you're ready to absolutely just pounce on it is it more visionary uh, to say you've got a compelling vision you you show something the the art of the possible yes, yes. and and having a tangible plan to say this is how i i take my my tiny steps in order to achieve that objective it's both one of the things that uh, i routinely uh, ask an entrepreneur that's that's pitching something very doable currently but the market is a little constrained i will say okay you know you're asking for let's say it's a five million dollar round on a you know 30 million dollar valuation like what happens if i give you two billion what do you do those are hard questions to answer by the way i've had that one thrown at me yeah. you know I, but they're, they're some of the most illustrative about what the entrepreneur really wants to do versus what they think they can get away with. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had one that it was an ag tech and it was, it was an earth observation company looking at, you know, crops on the ground. And I said, if I gave you two billion, would you, I was like, he, he kind of hemmed and hawed and, you know, came up with something that was just a little bit incremental. I'm like, no, I just gave you two billion. You only spent about 5 million of it. And he's like, okay, have you ever played Halo? And I said, yeah. And you remember the farms were just rings of, of, of agriculture and robots on it, just farming everything? I want to build those. I'm like, okay, that's a vision. That's something that I can see a long-term, you becoming a multi-billion dollar business. You've originally showed me that you know how to not lose me money and have a plan, but I need to know that both exist. Because the, for, for a, an investor to be able to allocate capital, um, in this risk profile, the payoffs have to be very, very large because all of your other investments, goose eggs. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you know, Michael, you're bringing up uh, a perspective which we share as manufacturers. So we're, especially Boeing and Northrop, we're sitting in the manufacturing arena and we hear about a potential market with services, right? Which is not what we do as a core. We, I would love for that market to be successful. So me to be a supplier, right? To do what I do well. I want these, these folks to be to grow as much agriculture in space as possible, right? Supplied by Northrop Grumman. So we're actually having the same similar conversations. Actually, CDFF is a, it's a wonderful conduit for that. We're looking at various industry stacks and we're trying to find, I'm gonna call them channel, you know, from a marketing perspective, channel partners, which are so singularly focused on biopharma or something. And I like in each in each market or in each vertical stack to be maybe three, four, five people that I talk with maybe commission some studies, maybe they lead me to an end consumer or a quasi end consumer. And that process of discovery informs the realm of the possible for me as a manufacturer. I certainly don't want to integrate in all those markets. That would be a mistake in my opinion personally, but discussing with them, I'm mean, hearing, hearing Tim's analysis on price per kilo to the moon and payload and what does it take? How do you streamline something? It's an evolutionary element, but I think it's gonna be exponentially faster. I'm gonna be an optimist here saying that moving from a nation state, wonderful success ISS, for example, into commercialization of Leo, and then more aggressive exploration of civil and hybrid of the moon. I think if we keep pressing, it's gonna be exponentially uh, less cycles, maybe more return on investment in, in the intermediaries where, uh, where everybody can win. Good. Um, Thank you, everybody. I do want to turn it over to the audience. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, I think we'll save our pitches for after the, uh, the, the this particular <laughs> session. Grab me after that if you want to want to pitch me. But that, that that's great. So uh, right here in the middle. Hi. Um, as the commercialization of space uh, turns into an international affair, um, is there a fear that uh, competition will underpin a new realm of economic strife between global superpowers? Um, and uh, as we take steps towards creating a market in the stars, how can we ensure that we walk in solidarity? Can you restate that last part? So as we, start, as we take steps towards building a market in the stars, how can we ensure that at, as at, internationally we walk in solidarity? Sure. I'm going to provide at least my quick take. Um, if you look at the international business world, um, it's very peaceful because everybody's making money, everybody's happy. Um, it's when uh, 
um, governments get involved and start doing things that are not market based, that's when you get strife. And part of the reason that I'm looking forward to a much more peaceful future in space is because the resources out there are so plentiful that there's nothing to fight over. Um, and there's a lot of room, so I'll pass it on to Ryan. I think leadership and precedents matter a lot in this, and, and NASA has done a great job with the Artemis Accords. Mm -hmm. It's a peaceful framework um, between governments. But as a company, we look at the Artemis Accords because it's precedent uh, is, to some extent, how do we conduct our business commercially? And so I think that strong leadership uh, to establish norms on a lot of these things that have not been done before uh, are very important. And so we, we need to maintain that leadership uh, in a peaceful and a productive and a cooperative way. Just to go, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, we don't look at it as competition. We want companies to, we want countries to come on and buy services from U.S. commercial platforms right that is great for the us and it still allows us to maintain um maybe strategic national global partnerships that are for the benefit of the us and other countries so we we look forward to other countries coming and w finding ways to buy services from our partners and security is important yeah, and they're security. great great folks across U.S. government and industry, considering what that security means, just like anywhere in the world, right? So in space as well, security, safety is important. It's important to the market. So that those those issues are certainly being tackled. And at the same time, I think to Michael's point, demonstrating the benefits of a vibrant open market, it's something that we are all promoting. And hopefully, folks around the world see that benefit and participate in business and not in peer-to-peer -peer nation state competition. I just add on one little thing. Uh, space is a huge endeavor. We need all the partners we can get. I think it's um, providing a sound vision, uh, as we have, you know, mentioned by ISS, the Artemis Accords, and, and now we're going to be releasing architectures here. I, I think with that, it's going to start giving the international community an idea of how they can participate, how they can be part of this. And I think through, you know, the, the commercial companies, that gives them a tangible. And I think we talked a little bit about if you can get the barrier to entry down low enough, you can really entice more internationals to want to come along in, in your destiny. And there are many ways they could participate. They can send their astronauts. There's so many countries that haven't actually had access to space before and sending the astronauts is a great way to put yourself on the map. You can develop technologies. We could collaborate on science and research. So there are many different areas that, you know, the opportunities for those collaborations. Thank you. Over here. So right now, space is kind of a, a hot topic. There's a lot of new companies that are coming in and joining the game. And um, I was just wondering if you guys think there is going to be space for consolidation, maybe, or if there's going to be some oversaturation in the coming years, given just how much new ideas and new companies are coming in? Well, I'll throw out one statistic that mm -hmm. says that yes. Um, for the panel, how many actual currently in existence, still actually trying to build something, rocket companies there are in the world? Mm -hmm. 150 or something. It used to be like 150. Wow. It's higher. <laughs> 184. 184 rocket development companies in the world. So yes, we don't need any more launch companies. Yeah, we Please do. stop. <laughs> <laughs> Even though only a handful have demonstrated. Exactly, so and that's I mean, that. I, I do, I do, I, I really appreciate that you said that because the what the things we're trying to do, while lift to space and affordable lift is very important, it's not the only thing. Mm -hmm. There are many pain points in the supply chain. And, and equipment we need to buy. I mean, even something, you'd be surprised how hard it is to get a decent radio um, in less than 18 months for a deep space mission. Mm -hmm. And so for the entrepreneurs out there, there are a lot of opportunities for you to come in and disrupt capability within the aerospace sector and never have to understand how a propulsion system works. <laughs> no offense to the prop folks out there. And looking at it from a, a different perspective, uh, I would say workforce. The good thing we might have uh, an over capability of people wanting to do launch vehicles and launch vehicle related products, but that's a unique skill set, something that is directly transferable 
across many of our needs. And so, you know, we encourage these people to come in, innovate. Um, we're going to learn something from them. And it's sooner or later, you know, if there is something that's a merger, a failed company, uh, I would say to those people, rest assured, there's more people out there looking for your talents than, than there are companies right now. Uh, last uh, it was it was from a year and a half ago. There are two hundred thousand open positions in the aerospace field right now, and we, the, the bodies to fill them simply do not exist. So we need to pull in people from outside, especially in specific areas. And and Tim knows this well: GNC, avionics, and software. Right? Yes. <laughs> we are Across lacking the, the talent yeah. and the skills. So yes. So, so demand is good, right? Overall, and I I like to hear that there are 184 launch companies than one. Yeah, yes. exactly. So I hope the trend continues to demonstrate though, yeah. Andre, I gotta demonstrate. And, and that's part of the risk posture too, right? I, I wouldn't expect, again, a, a Boeing or a Northrop to go all in on a new launch concept, but a new company would take that risk, mm -hmm. right? Make the investments, earn your chops. And if it works, great, we've done something new and amazing. If not, that is a seed pot of talent and experiences that goes out back into the workforce and will recombine into other great ideas. Thank you, guys. Yeah. On this side? Yeah. So uh, during the whole talk, we spent a lot of time talking about the uh, customer. It's kind of hard kind of hard to hear. Can you speak a little bit closer? To okay. Thanks. Yep. So we spent a lot of time talking about the customer. But however, there's still a large amount of the citizens who do not know this new industry that will grow rapidly in the next decade. So what's your like a marketing strategy that will educate those potential customer in the future? Marketing strategy. Yeah. I'll actually uh, approach that one a little bit. And this goes back to um, the, the comment about, I made about Super Bowl ad. Um, we do need um, across the board marketing because if you go out um, I was actually at, at NASA HQ when we were talking about, and this came up where, um, and sorry for this one, um, <laughs> but I asked the question of, and we're going back to the ultimate customer, who's NASA's ultimate customer, and it's Congress. And the statement was, well, no, and NASA's ultimate customer is the American people. And sad to say, most of the American people aren't paying attention. So, yeah, I think a Super Bowl ad for NASA would be awesome. I think we might have actually done yeah, that. Yeah, we've done that. Yeah. Well, uh, but it, uh, yeah, I agree. There, and if you it, expand on that, we need more non-space people yes. in space. Yes. Like, it's all well and good for us to talk about how many kilograms we can put on the moon. What are you going to do with the damn thing, right. right? And having people that are there that are doing things that non-rocket scientists are interested, that's how we, we begin educating customers. Well, you can do this, and here's how you either do business or art or music, whatever it is humans want to do, but it needs to be stuff other than just the engineering of going. I, I get a perfect example would be, I know a lot of people in this room will probably laugh about it, but the Tom Cruise movie that he's still working on shooting um, along with Axiom on the ISS. I think that would probably be number, short of watching, you know, rockets land back at the, at the Cape from SpaceX. That's probably, gonna, probably the biggest thing to bring people into our sector is getting it out of our little egghead community and getting it out on the big screen so that everybody else can watch it. I agree. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Over here. Um, hi. Yeah, I just wanted to get your thoughts on what you guys thought uh, would, would envision. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on what regulation would look like in the space industry, especially since space is like still international waters. And especially I'd love... Uh, your thoughts, Camille? I'll jump into that one really quick. I, I would say right now we, we have a process of innovation that is severely outpacing the regulatory environment. And um, I, I'm thinking with National Space Council, if you're following that, uh, they just had a, a users uh, advisory group meeting. And I think that was a common thread to say, how do we authorize to make sure that activities we, we do in space are not detrimental to future use of space, uh, to satisfying you know, those obligations uh, to regulatory? And you know, right now, I think, it, it, again, the evolution of the process is we're, we're right now building the infrastructure of all that. Um, it's the, the knowledge base 
of how to make things safe and how to understand if something is safe or not, I'm going to say is probably housed in some of the industry partners and the most part within NASA. And so the big question is, um, if FAA is to come in and regulate, how do we get a transfer of knowledge yes. uh, with that? And, and I think, you know, the, the first step in that equation is going to be, sorry, an old engineering term, is going to be how do we do it for transportation? Uh, I think you heard from the panel before us then, how do you how do you go about that for commercial LEO destinations to where it's a minimal investment by the government, but at some point NASA is going to put an astronaut on there. We, we've had the luxury of working with NASA on commercial crew to where we get direct feedback, whereas we're looking at a different business model with commercial LEO destinations to where they want to be one of many users and they are being a, uh, a supporter of the development um, but the question is, is, you know, is that enough insight oversight for them to understand the details of uh, engineering decisions uh, that affect safety and, you know, health of the crews? So, so yeah, I mean, we, we are actively working that we, the model we have right now, we're in a phase where we have these funded Space Act agreements with our partners, which does not allow us to levy requirements for the safe operation transportation of our crew and our payloads right but we have this strategy where we are you know developing in draft these requirements that we could um show to our partners or provide to our partners as kind of initial insights so as they are designing and the reason we don't want to levy requirements is because we want you to come up with innovation yeah. innovative solutions without the weight of NASA requirements, you know, killing your business model before you even started, right? But we are going to send astronauts, so we are clear that we have to have some requirements. So we're working through that process now, and and um, you know, hopefully our strategy is successful. And then there'll be some stops and reloads, and we'll have to figure some things out. I think the good news is, while a lot of these space commerce questions are fresh in this in the space transportation and capabilities world we've got a couple hundred years of pretty good commerce law and policy and um, lessons learned terrestrially that are a rich resource for us to turn to the people who do business who do international business and say okay how is this like um, international commerce how is it different and what can we leverage from those models that already exist maybe do better where it, it's falling short and so it's not completely blank slate. Uh, I think we have some people that can help us that haven't thought about space before, maybe. So one, you know, here's an opportunity for you young people, right? Obviously, there's, there are tremendous technological and scientific opportunities here in the growing of the space market. They're equally challenging business model, regulatory, all the all whole of humanity are equally challenging issues that need to be solved. And I hope that the young folks get inspired to enter the space industry from those perspectives as well. Yes, we actually do need space lawyers. <laughs> um, I, I will throw back at, at least one, you know, toss back is, is NASA has a set of safety way it views safety. Mm -hmm. But as we've seen with things like, for example, Jared Isaacman is doing with Polaris mm -hmm. Dawn, there are a lot of people out there that have a very different understanding of safety. Mm -hmm. And if you make it safe, they won't have any interest in participating because they actually want to be out They're there in the front. Ones. So, you know, they're different markets have different requirements and so whichever market you have is what you serve so i got one last question over here yeah in the case of billionaires who are able to bring their own funding into the market do you have any suggestions for how to enforce regulations in terms of consequences when a fine can be treated kind of as a fee for conducting business for example if someone were to generate an orbital debris generating event um, how how do we create consequences that are meaningful enough to deter people with a lot of money from doing what they want to do. At least for me, I'll go back to something that Tim just said, you know, the, the rest of the entire industrialized world deals with that kind of stuff all the time. Um, international law has ways of dealing with this. We understand how to negotiate jurisdictions between contracts, um, between contracts in different countries that have different sets of rules. Um, you know, that if you create a debris field, um, that's a tort. 
you could actually, someone gets hit by that, you could very easily have a legal action against that company and, and get damages. And that could easily, and especially under the Outer Space Treaty and the liability conventions for a lot of that, there are cases where um, you can take that stuff to court. So this is one of the things that's interesting about space, uh, especially from a legal and other standpoints is, is we think it's special that for some reason law doesn't exist in space, but no. It's everybody down here who's going, and we're taking all of our jurisdictions with us and all of the laws that we currently have with us. And so it's, it's, you know, there may be some corner cases, but by and large, most industrial law handles this stuff just fine. Anything? Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. A little bit five minutes over, and I think we're the last one, so I'm keeping everybody from the, uh, from the bar probably. Um, but uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, feel free to ask any questions of us later on. Thank you.